Welcome back to the channel, hope everybody's doing well. And what we have in front of us here is a high current winding tester. Um, I built this test box up around about seven, eight years ago. Um, I haven't used it for a couple of years, but I do have a client now that has got some problems with a generator rotor. So I'm proposing to do some tests on that rotor for them to see if there's any issues with it. One of them is to measure the winding resistance, and this is what I would use to measure that with. So I need to check this out to make sure it's functioning okay. So I thought it'd make quite a good video to go through how I calibrate this and check out its functionality. Um, this is the winding resistant box here in front of you. This is the test leads that I use. Um, depending on what style of rotor I connect to, I have these clamp plates that go around slip rings that you then ratchet on and I connect onto the stud there. Or I can bolt these straight onto uh, a brushless excitation system and work in that manner. Um, to calibrate it, just in the corner over here, you can see we've got a load resistance box. We're going to need some meters, and I'm going to need the current injection test set as well. So this is what the test set looks like with the lid open. Um, you have the output connections here on the right-hand side uh, that our main leads bolt onto. This test set can put out 15 volts at 100 amps. So what I would do is connect this up to the winding and make a number of measurements at different output currents. We'll be measuring the output current via this millivolt shunt here and measure the actual voltage being applied to the winding. That's then simple Ohm's law to calculate the resistance of the winding. I would do that at a number of different test currents and hopefully I should get a straight line plot. Uh, I just put this screen up here that shows you a test carried out on a previous generator rotor and you can see the straight line that you get at the different test points showing a very low likelihood of cracks in the winding. You can also see that I compare it to the original manufacture specification to do that it has to be temperature adjusted and you can get a deviation from that uh, ideally you want to be within plus or minus two percent of that value for a good winding uh, just back to the actual test set itself you have voltage control and current control so i can either inject a voltage or a current for doing a winding i'm usually using this current control here that's selectable on this switch here and you can turn the output on and off with this switch here. Up at the top here we've got a power meter. This is just to check the power coming in to the instrument to make sure I'm not overloading the supply and to assist with the calibration of this power meter and the current shunt I have a little test jack here and I made up this special test lead as well so this plugs straight onto this jack. When it's in use I just have this covering it all up so there's no problems and nobody's going to interfere with it but then when I want to calibrate it I plug this in and I can make the necessary measurements. And then over to this side here, we do have a special input jack on this. So uh, this is a Buccaneer connector, 32 amps. Um, it also stops anybody meddling with a test set unless you have the lead as well. It doesn't take a lead with a standard IEC connector. I did that deliberately. Uh, the box will work from 110 volts and 240 volts. And then finally, I do have the on off switch here. So that's the basics of the test set. As you can see at the back there, it's had its electrical safety checks done on it. So now we'll set up and we'll do some calibrations to make sure the unit is functioning correctly. Okay, so my first set of tests on the winding resistance tester is to look at the accuracy on the AC power meter here to see what the test set consumes. Um, this, I'm just looking at for around about 5% accuracy on this. It's not that critical. I just have it put in there to make sure that I'm not overpowering the socket that I'm feeding this test set from. Um, to do this test, the test set is switched off. And what I do is I power just the power meter and its current signal from my special test lead here that I made up. When I built the test set, I just pan around and hopefully you can see at the top here, everything's plugged into my Mega SMRT1. Got the current in on the red leads, voltage in on the black leads. And then with my laptop over here, I can set a number of test points here and check the voltage, current and wattage and frequency that the instrument displays and see that it matches. So I'll reset everything so you can get a good view of the power meter here and we'll inject some voltages. We've reset so you can hopefully see the display on the AC power meter now. Um, we can turn it on and with this power meter, let's go through them here, uh, we can select volt, amps, watts or hertz. You can see I'm injecting here 230 volts and 0 amps at 50 hertz. So we've got our volts there, 
go through we're on 0 0.06 amps watts is one and 50 hertz there um, let's just move the frequency so you can see that 48 hertz so there you go smack on 48 hertz let's go up to 52 and you can see there 51.9 52 uh, it's all okay and we're still reading 228 the voltage shifts a little bit when you change the frequency but it's pretty good uh, let's go down to 50 hertz again and we'll go to uh, 110 volts this time so you can see 109.8 now so you can see the meter does work on 110 volts as well let's go there's your frequency um, so let's stick in 10 amps turn him on as well so you can see we're reading 9.94 amps now and then you can see we can work out should be around about 1100 watts shouldn't it so 1090 that seems to be all good if I change the angle on this and change it to 30 degrees you see that the watts will go down 158 watts there uh, I'll put the screen up here from the injection test set so you can see what that's doing uh, but I can take a load of measurements now from different currents and voltages injected and see that the meter is working to the tolerance that I'd like it to so one of the other measurements I have to make is of the resistance of the current shunt you can see I'm reading here 503 micro ohms I'm using the 2450 source meter to do this and I'm using two of the test leads from my test connector to source the current into the current shunt and then taking the actual reading from the millivolt jacks on the test unit itself. Those are the millivolt jacks I'll be using during the actual measurement I'll be making on a rotor winding. And you can see as the test goes on, the temperature does creep up a little bit on this. 504 micro ohms we're on now, so we're injecting one amp. Um, I do record the temperature as well normally that's 21 degrees c as you can see here although it's just moved a little bit when i move this and what i will actually do is feed that value back into my test sheet and temperature correct this resistance reading i've got from the 2450 to the nominal value so i can get a more accurate comparison I'll turn him off so i put this little snippet of the calibration sheet up here you can see that the winding resistance box should be nominal 500 micro ohms the actual reading I got was 503 and temperature corrected to 21.2 degrees C which is what I read from my fluke it is 500.67 micro ohms and that gives me a variance of 0.13 percent so that's within the 0.25 percent nominal tolerance so our final test on our winding resistance tester is to check the output voltage from the unit itself um, we are set up with a load resistor on the right here, which is 10 ohms load. Um, our fluke here is measuring the voltage across that load. Our Keysight U1282A measuring the direct current coming from the winding resistance test box coming straight through. Um, the millivolt coming from the current shunt is actually down on the Keithley DMM7510. That's out of shock because I've run out of table space. And just for a bit of amusement, I've got the SG-004A across the output of the shunt as well, measuring the voltage there. I go up in five steps on the vernier dial here, so it'll be set to 1, 2.5, 5, 7.5 and 10. And I'll record the various measurements on the meters for each one of those settings. Uh, so we'll take this up to number one, which is that one there, and we'll switch the output on. Um, we should get some readings on the meters. So this is reading very, very low millivolts. Um, you can see we've got uh, 37 milliamps coming from the test set. Uh, we've got uh, 380 millivolts, 388 millivolts on the SG-004A there. We can turn him to millivolts on there. Got 380 on the Fluke, 381 against 385, 6. Yeah, still does bounce around a little bit more, this one does. Um, let's take him up to one of the other ones so that we can uh, get a bit more out. Um, 
what we do need to be careful of is so there's our 2.5 setting and we are reading uh, 286 milliamps 290 milliamps going in uh, 2.95 volts across the shunt itself um, just crept up to over 3 volts across the actual load resistor there on the fluke and my actual Keithley is reading uh, 0.143 millivolts so pretty low voltages and currents being measured really so you do need some quite good instruments to make these measurements unfortunately my fluke there which is mine isn't the best of the instruments uh, when I worked for my other job I used to have another key site which had more resolution a bit more accurate so that would have been better uh, but we just have to make do with what we've got so I'll carry on and doing those readings going through what I do have to do is change to the higher amp on this one when we go because we'll go over 440 milliamps when we go to the next one but we'll just wind it all the way up to the top uh, which is easy to get to okay so there's our maximum output there so you can see we are reading 15.04 across the actual load resistor which is marrying up to 15.046 on the SG-004A we're pushing through 1.464 amps from the actual supply and the voltage on my current shunt is 0.72778 millivolts so we can feed some of those into the data tables and we can get some more readings out so I've visually inspected the test leads to make sure they are all okay. And with this next test, I'm going to inject 100 amps through the test leads that I would use and see what the actual resistance of those leads are and to check that the crimp connections are all good. So one end of my test leads are here. These are the two that would go to the rotor winding to inject the current. The other end I've just shorted out on one of the clamp plates that I use on slip rings. I'll put a picture up for that now so you can see what that is like. And we have set our test set to current injection this time. Uh, our output is on and all we need to do this time winding up the current on this right hand control. Our U128A there is reading the millivolts off of the current shunt and then our fluke is measuring across the actual output of the lead. So dividing this reading by this reading will give me the overall resistance of the two leads together. Um, so we'll wind him up. Again, when I'm going through the test, so I do do this in four stages, uh, four or five stages in actual fact, and get readings at different measurement points. So uh, it gives me a bit better idea and what I should be getting is a straight line across all the readings so that the resistance stays constant and uh, so you could have there so across our millivolt shunt we've got 52.633 millivolts and 5.328 millivolts across the actual output of the uh, test box so we'll check the measurement with the HT208D from Kai Wheats we have zeroed our DC current reading there we'll stick him across the actual lead hold button and there you can see we're actually putting in 107.7 amps there on that one so you can see the readings are all okay from the two measurements there I will be able to work out the resistance of the leads to check that they are all okay and that is that test completed so the other thing we can do of course to check out connections where high currents are is to actually do a thermography uh, which we can see here hopefully if I can put these pictures up to you um, and you'll be able to see the connections and the heat being generated on them so this is the leads coming out of the test set there it certainly seems to be a bit hotter connection coming off the black lead there doesn't it and then we can go down to the actual leads on the floor there and the shorting block and we can get some pictures there okay that'll be it for this video 
Uh, I'll leave you with some pictures of the test system being used. First couple of pictures here are the cables bolted onto some buzz bars for a brushless excitation system. And you can see the main two leads bolted on alongside some crocodile clip connections for the actual voltage measurement onto the winding. And the next couple of pictures are an application for a static excitation system where we have the slip rings. You can see the plates onto the surface of the slip rings held in place with some ratchet straps. And then the connections made onto the plates. And then finally here, this is the actual test setup with the instrument itself all connected up, a couple of meters up in front. And you can see I have a protocol sheet to write down the readings and then I can take that away and do the calculations and assess the winding resistance. So I hope you found that interesting. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next video.